Let's continue to look at elections conducted using preference ballots. The basic question is, if we have conducted such an election, if every voter has filled out a preference ballot, and if that information has been recorded in a preference schedule, how do we resolve the election? How do we decide which candidate is the winner? And as we said, we're going to study four possible methods. Here again, I've listed them plurality method, and so on. And in fact, in this lecture, I'm simply going to talk briefly about the first method, the so-called plurality method. In fact, this is the method that we use in politics in the United States. And if really this is the method you're going to use, then most of what we've said about using preference ballots and preference schedules are just unnecessary. Because what the plurality method says is, the candidate with the most first choice votes wins. Now notice we didn't say the candidate with the majority of first choice votes wins. Of course, if there is a candidate with a majority, that candidate will indeed win. However, it's possible to have more first choice votes than anyone else and still not have a majority. The word that we use here is plurality. Okay. If a candidate has more votes than any other candidate, we say that that candidate has a plurality. This is not the same as the word majority. That candidate might have a majority, but might not. Let's look at an, an example. This is an example from 1994. There was an election for the United States Senate for the seat in, or one of the seats in Virginia. And with the exception of a few scattered votes, almost everyone voted for one of three candidates. Those candidates were Charles Robb, the Democrat, Oliver North, the Republican, and J. Marshall Coleman, the Independent. And you'll see each of those candidates received a substantial number of votes in the hundreds of thousands. What I want us to note here is that no candidate received a majority of the votes. Charles Robb received 45 percent and more. Oliver North almost 43 percent. But the third candidate, Coleman, received between 11 and 12 percent. Now the way that that election was decided was very simple. It really wasn't a close call at all. Namely, Robb won. Okay, now notice Rob won despite the fact that he did not win a majority. He had a plurality and not a majority. Now, what's wrong with this method? Why would not one not want to use this method? Well, we're pretty used to it in the U.S. and maybe we're happy with it. Certainly an advantage of it is that it's very simple, easy to implement, and people don't have to understand anything about these preference ballots. On the other hand, a defect is it may lead to a winner that most voters don't like. And it also may enable a spoiler. In that election we were just looking at, we might regard Coleman as some sort of a spoiler, depending on which other candidate he took votes away from. If he were out of the race, it might be that the race would come out a different way. A similar remark might apply to Ross Perot, who ran in two presidential elections. He was considered the third candidate. No one ever thought that he had a chance to really win that election. However, he might have made the difference between the two top candidates, the Democratic and Republican candidates. So there may be reasons to think that maybe the plurality method is not so good, and this is particularly true in elections where there are lots of candidates. You see, it may happen that there's a winner that doesn't get very many votes, gets 20 or 30 percent of the vote, and yet that's more than any other candidate, and therefore that candidate will win.